Tonight we're going to be going over the um, characteristic of God or attribute of God that he is everywhere. Last time we covered the fact that uh, he is omnipotent, that he is all-powerful. But here tonight that he is omnipresent, present everywhere. If you think of bad environments and good environments, perhaps school or work or you can be around surrounded with people that are taking drugs that are sexually perverted and you're around them and you're like uh, you're not quite sure and you're, uh, or you can be around people that are just really gung-ho for God and excited and want to serve God and ah, it's great uh, or in between where people are dead and <laughs> have no life in them and you want to go probe them okay come on get going and whatever environment you're in there's a certain sense of how do I respond to this how do I react with this well there's an environment that we cannot escape there's an environment that no matter where we go that environment is there we call it the presence of God. No matter where we go, God is in that environment. Kind of hard to wrap our brains around that, but that he is there. And as an older man, and uh, I've been in many, many different places, right? Uh, I remember I was telling someone that we were in Dar Salaam in Africa, and we were in this bus and Oralia, I don't know if you remember Oralia, we were going and this, we were in it and we got into this place and there was a sea of black people everywhere, all around us. And we were the only white ones. And it's like, okay, I mean, you don't I mean, you feel weird. And then we started hearing, hey, and they were calling in African Swahili or whatever it was. And I'm like, what is that? They're calling us, look, the white people, look, the white people. <laughs> and there was just black people everywhere. And there was this sense of fear, like, what's going to happen here? No, they weren't saying anything bad about it. They're just like, oh, look, look, it's a different person than us. But it felt weird. And I've been in other places where, uh, there in Africa as well, where uh, the killing of people uh, had taken place in mass. There were graves that we went to that over 100, 500 people were buried in one grave. Um, genocide had happened. And you feel like this is weird environment. Uh, massive killings. And so, and then I've been in concerts, right? The concert, everybody's excited and jumping up and down. And the lights are going. And <laughs> Um, and God was in all those environments. God was in all of those environments. And the fact that God is omnipresent, present everywhere, if we can keep that in mind, then it can keep us steady no matter the environment we're in. Because we can always go to and this is what this study tonight is, as we go through these verses on the uh, omnipresence of God, that he's present everywhere, that's what we're going to see over and over and over. Uh, actually, this uh, study tonight is going to be a little short, shorter than, than usual, so if you might be thinking of questions or comments that you might have, uh, be ready for that, but if not, that's okay. So we're gonna start in your booklet, uh, page 49, uh, at the very top, and if you don't have that book, that that's okay, you can just listen. Um, it's going to be, again, page 49 in your booklet. And we start off with Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is a very popular psalm among those that read the psalms. Uh, this is just verses 7 through 10. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. 
where can I go from, your, from thy spirit? Or where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me, and thy right hand will uh, lay hold of me. There is no place where God is not present. There's no circumstance or experience where God is not there. And in this psalm, in this section, this is what you need to know, that um, uh, where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If you, I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. What's called a mirism, a figure of speech, uh, from the heavens, the highest, all the way to Sheol, where people are dead. No matter where I go, right, the highs or the lows, and that represents uh, quality as well. If I go to heaven where there's bliss and absolute perfection and joy and wonderful and perfection and relationships and love and all that, you're there. But if I go to the deepest place of death where there is no hope, where there is no just death and, and my life is, I just want to die. You are there. And that's what the psalmist is saying. It's a mirrorism where it's everywhere, the highest and the lowest. But it's not just that. Now he goes to, if I take my wings to the dawn, and if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, the dawn uh, is the east. And uh, this was uh, a psalm of David, and it's in Palestine. And the dawn, of course, is the east, right? And the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, is on the west. The east, uh, Palestine, was the land of promise, of hope, and of the future being wonderful. Uh, and the sea was the place of dread, of chaos, of danger, of fear, of anxiety. And so the psalmist is saying, if I am in a place of hope, in a place of promise, in a place of energy, I, I, I've got something to live for, God is there with me. But if I'm in a place of chaos and dread and even death, God is there with me. God is there with me. He is present everywhere, in all circumstances. And that's what he's talking about. Uh, all of Psalm 39 uh, is a wonderful psalm, but it also speaks in other, in other places in the psalm about the omnipresence of God. So there's no place or circumstance or experience where God is not present. Genesis 28, 16, this is uh, about Jacob. And some of you might remember that Jacob was a trickster and he had deceived his father by the help of his mother. Talk about dysfunctional. <laughs> and he was fleeing now, and um, he, he ended up in a place where it was utterly dark, and he had nothing, and his pillow, his pillow, his pillow was not a, a down pillow, very nice from the hotel. It's like, ha, no, his pillow was a stone, and he was surrounded by darkness. And God came to him, and instead of judging him, he blesses him. And he wakes up, and that's, we pick it up in verse 28, I mean, Genesis 28, verse 16. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. I did not know it. Even though God was there, the presence, the, the environment is God in the midst of darkness, a rock for a pillow, and he was asleep. That's a, a metaphor for being dead. In darkness and in death. And yet God was there. He's here with me. Uh, we may not be aware of God, that God is present everywhere we are. And we all have that tendency to forget. Right? We, we, we forget. 
And then we become anxious or angry or frustrated and we want to punch somebody or we want to whatever. Jacob's, surely God was here. I didn't even know it. And Jacob wasn't aware of the massive, massive grace of God with him. And once again, you and I, in many ways, can be the same. You see, but God is present everywhere in all circumstances and ready to give us grace. Exodus 20, verse 24. Exodus 20, you should remember, uh, that's where the Ten Commandments were given, right in that chapter, chapter 20. All the Ten Commandments, the moral, the moral, the absolute moral will of God was given there. You shall make an altar of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you. This is where just the Ten Commandments were given, but they were moving. And so wherever you go, you're going to build an altar where I put my name, and you're going to worship me there wherever I put my name. Uh, God's blessing can come no matter where we are. But God's moral will is to be followed. That's paramount. That's absolutely cr critical. But it doesn't matter where we are because why? God is everywhere. God is everywhere. Um, 1 Kings 8, 27, 1 Kings 8, 27. But will God dwell, uh, indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and earth, uh, the highest heaven cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built for you. And Solomon's temple was massive. It was beautiful. Lots and lots of gold everywhere. Uh, and it, it was huge. And Solomon says, Man, can this temple hold you? I mean, heaven and earth, the highest heaven can contain you. You're bigger than that. But there are places to help us, right? Places of worship. Uh, whether we want to or not, we enter a building, and if we worship there, it's like, you know, it's kind of a special place. Uh, something different about it than me going to a restaurant or my own house or a party or something, you enter here like, well, yeah, there's a certain respect. Um, worship places are aids for us. They're aids. They help us. But we must remember that God is everywhere. These buildings are just helps to, have, to help us worship and remember God. Deuteronomy 4.36, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4.36, out of the heavens... He let you hear his voice to discipline you. And on the earth, he let you see his, uh, his great fire. And you heard his words from the midst of the fire. That's a, wouldn't it be great if all of a sudden, okay, God, we hear this massive voice that we know it's God. And there's a massive fire. It's like, whoa, that's God. But we don't get that, right? We have his word, the Bible, but in that situation, God was speaking to the children of Israel, and he says, now, what nation has that? What nation has their God who speaks to them out of the fire, and they hear his voice? No nation. You are very, very, very privileged, and that's the point. Uh, God works through his word, but also through everything we use for life he loves us and that's the point there in Deuteronomy where the people could have been killed by God because of their rebellion and yet they didn't get killed in fact God sent them a fire and he spoke to them and he said what nation has this awesome God that can do this no nation but you are my people now as believers, as believers in the New Testament, we belong to God. And so we read of his word. Whether it was Israel way back in Palestine, you know, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, or here right now. He is present. And he gives us the privilege of knowing him. 
And that's what the Israelites had forgotten about the massive, massive privilege that they had to know God. And you see, I am like everybody else. I forget. I forget, and by the time I know it, something else has taken my attention and my passions and my, my, my drive to get something or whatever, and I forget. And that's why it's very important to come back and say, oh, yes, oh, yes. God is present everywhere, and he gives us the privilege of knowing him. He really loves us. Deuteronomy 4, verse 39, a few verses later, Deuteronomy 4, verse 39, Know therefore today and take it to your heart that the Lord, He is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. So uh, if God occupies, if God, God, the only God there is, occupies the heaven and earth, guess what? There's no room for another God. <laughs> He's everywhere. He's big enough and He, can, he, he occupies everywhere. There's no room for any other God in our lives, is the point. But we must remember that God is everywhere. We must, if we're going to live by that truth and be guided and be, be steadied by that reality that he is everywhere. Jeremiah 23, verse 23 and 24. Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord? And not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him? Declared the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? Declared the Lord. In Jeremiah 23, what he's getting at is that he judges. And we cannot hide from God. I mean, and again, this is where we have selective memory, right? We have selective memory. We forget that God is everywhere, especially, especially when we're going to do what's wrong or we do what's wrong. God doesn't really know. Oh, well, he's not here. <laughs> it's silly, but we all do it. We all do it. And so to come back again, it's like God himself says, can a man hide from me and me not see him? Really? No, I'm everywhere. I am everywhere. Um, there is nowhere to escape God's judgment or discipline. Uh, you know, the old experience of little kids, tiny little kids, right? Uh, if uh, they don't see you, they think you don't see them, right? <laughs> we can tell stories at our house. There was a curtain there in our old house, and we played hide and seek, and some of our kids would go behind the, the curtain and their feet would be all showing, but they're hiding. <laughs> we can see their feet down there. Uh, I remember David, especially one time we were uh, eating all eating right and he wanted cookies, but he hadn't finished. And he knew he should, couldn't ask for cookies. And I was sitting right here. David was here in the high chair, high chair and then she was over there. And David goes, Mommy, can I have a cookie? <laughs> he puts his hand so that I don't see him. Okay, he you know. That's what we do with God. That's what we do with God. You know? Oh, he's not going to see me, and I can do. You know, it's, it's a night. He can't see me. Hmm. No. No way to escape God's judgment or discipline when he needs to. Isaiah 57, Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. There is no need for fear when one is humble before God. He is holy, yet he is also with the contrite. That is just mind-boggling. I mean, we think, oh, that uh, priest... Or that holy person, he would never, ever, ever go into a bar where there's prostitutes. In there. He would never go there. Oh, God is everywhere. God is everywhere. And here in this text, what he's saying is, even though he is holy, he's also with the contrite of spirit. Especially 
especially with the contrite of spirit, he's there. So if we want the presence of God, just humble ourselves. We just need to humble ourselves, right? He's right there with us, even though he's absolutely holy. And that's what he's getting at in Isaiah 57, in verse 15. Acts 17 and verse 24, this is uh, in Acts 17, this is where the Apostle Paul uh, gets to Athens. And Athens is a place where the Greeks and the philosophers were, and they weren't uh, believers. They were just kind of philosophers and, and theologians of some kind. And Paul is talking to them, and he says, uh, Acts 17, verse 24, the God who made the world and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now in Athens, there were hundreds of temples to the different gods. It's a pantheon. It was just a massive number of gods, different gods. And uh, Paul says, not in, hand made, not in temple made with hands. He's Lord of heaven and earth. God is Lord everywhere. And we are not, and he is not limited to a location. Right? Because, again, people make the mistake of, well, you know, in church, you don't cuss. But anywhere else, well, <coughs> God is not here. <laughs> no, God is everywhere. Uh, the next page, Acts 17, verse 27 and 28, page uh, 50. Again, there in Athens, as Paul is speaking, and they should seek, that is, people everywhere should seek God, if perhaps they might grope uh, for, uh, for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us, for, he, uh, for in him, in him, in him, in God, we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Some of the poets of the Athenians uh, had made those claims that we, we are God's offspring. Somehow they knew. Uh, God is our environment, is the point. Uh, we, in Him, in Him, it says, we live and move and exist. Um, what do we need? We need to drop to our knees, right? We need to drop to our knees. Uh, that's all we need and to find God. He's right there no matter where we go. Uh, people in uh, ISIS, uh, in, in Syria, wherever they are at, they can just drop to their knees and say, God, I need you. And they'll find him. Um, he's there in Job 34, the last one. And then, as I said, this is going to be a short one. We'll open it up for your questions or your comments. Job 34, verses 14 through 15. If he should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together, and men would return to dust. Uh, God is in the very breath we breathe. So, if you really get that, if you really understand that, it's sheer grace of God that we live from hour to hour. The, the breath, air is, it belongs to him. And he's, he can just take it all away. And we would return to dust. So really, again, it's like, man, I need to, I need to bow down and worship God. He's everywhere. He knows my life. He knows my sin. And yet, I'm still alive still alive. There's no place I can hide. I can take cocaine and feel great. Guess what? He's there. I may be so depressed that I want to commit suicide. Guess what? He is there. I may be full of joy and excitement over false assumptions and promises of life. God is there ready to take me when I, everything fails. Or I can be in the midst of chaos and hatred and whatever and think there's no hope. No, God is there. God is there. What do we need? Bend the knee because he's with the contrite of spirit. God 
is